You're listening to the Science Circle Podcast. It's a nonprofit program serving a global alliance of scientists, educators, students, and you. Welcome. Today the topic is podcast, and the Science Circle podcast in particular, we've got some of our very best uh, Science Circle presenters going to be talking in uh, our audio clip. So if everybody's ready to go, let's get rolling. Podcasts first became a thing in 2005, and that's when Apple first allowed people to post their own MP3s for download to the iPod. I still have one of those in a drawer, and that's why it's called a podcast. All these years later, 48 million people in the USA listen to podcasts weekly. That's 17% of the U.S. population. And 11% of the population in the UK also tunes in a podcast weekly. That's another 6 million listeners. And there's much more of this data if you love these kind of numbers. You can check at sources such as Pew Research. Uh, deservedly, Apple comes in first in podcast distribution at 52% of the market, with Spotify in second place at 19%. And Google Play coming in far behind at just 1%. However, Google has been poked awake, and Google is planning to double the amount of podcast consumption in the next two years. Uh, they're going to be putting podcasts in their search engine, and there's also a new podcast app coming out by Google. Analysts are saying it's possible Google could well capture a third of podcast distribution over the next two years, splitting the audience share with Apple and Spotify and all the other platforms looking for a piece. I'm glad to say that iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play are each carrying the Science Circle podcast, as are a number of other platforms, as we'll see in just a moment. And as we work at the Science Circle to serve a global student body, it helps to remember that much of the world has very limited Internet access and bandwidth, and billions of people rely on slow-feeding cell phones for their primary access to economic and health and educational resources. So podcasts are a very appropriate way to bring our programs to the world. So far, we've aired more than a dozen podcasts. Here's a chart of prior guests and topics. We've got one or two of you in the room. Mike, I know you're out there. And uh, we're going to be listening to the top 10 podcast takeaways to date. Each regular podcast runs for about 15 minutes. And that's about the top end you want to use for best listener learning and retention. And that's what we want to do. We want to be educational. We want to connect with our learners and hopefully have them remember what it is we're talking about. So we try to keep these nice 15-minute packages or shorter. And, of course, all the episodes are freely available for your educational use. And here is a screenful of the platforms currently carrying the Science Circle podcast. Uh, if you grab the PDF of these slides right there, stage right, click the sign there. It'll give you a nice PDF file, and there are active links in there, so you can click directly on the podcast feed at any one of these platforms. Or you can go to www.mr.us and click the podcast link at the top. It's not hard to find. Uh, some of these platforms are not especially easy to get. It's the quality of our episodes and the guests so far, the production values, that fussy XML file that you have to get just right. And that's what got us picked up. So thanks to all the podcast guests for that. And we'll be hearing from them shortly. Uh, and you can find each episode posted on the Science Circle website. And a shout out to Augustine, who I think just crashed, couldn't be with us here today. But thank you, Augustine. Uh, he gives such talented and quick support getting these podcasts posted on the Science Circle pages. And, of course, many, many thanks to Chantal and Jess for the many, many things that you do. And we're also on iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and uh, Shoutcast streaming. We stream uh, nonstop on Shoutcast with musical interludes if you want the Science Circle podcast running all day. And there's also TuneIn and a bunch of others, CastBox, Overcast, Podcast App, and uh, iHeartRadio, still pending. It takes a while for them to review. 
uh, so far, we've got 100% pickup. Every uh, platform we've submitted to has picked up the uh, podcast. It's a synergistic combination of resources and missions between the Science Circle Foundation and my own Ijikari Research Project. Uh, our mission statements read like they were written by the same uh, person, don't they? Uh, here we are promoting uh, both of us, promoting open uh, source education worldwide for science enthusiasts and expanding accessible free learning opportunities and resources for international students and educators. Our two organizations each have their own board of directors. There they are. What a great group of faces here. A uh, Science Circle organization founded in 2008. Uh, Educare Research founded in 2013. And both are recognized nonprofit organizations by our respective governments in the Netherlands and the United States on our boards, we've got a number of PhDs and digital education innovators and even a nurse and a search engine specialist as we reach out to a global online audience. And just look at what Science Circle has to offer in its 10 years of work. Scientists, educators, students, science fans and members in virtual worlds and social media in some 17 different countries ranging from Australia, hi Jess, Austria, Canada, Denmark, Finland, Germany, Hungary, India, Italy, Japan, Mexico, the Netherlands, Russia, Sweden, Switzerland, and the United Kingdom, as well as the United States of America. That's where I am today. It's not the United Nations, but still a worldwide gathering, an impressive group of people, and they bring experience and topics from archaeology, astrophysics, brain science, computer science, economics, education, the environment, genetics, geology, history, languages, mathematics, neuroscience, psychology, quantum physics, transculturalism, and all the way to zoology. And that's not even half of the field. Chantel and Jess and the founding members do have much to be proud of. Uh, the Science Circle recently celebrated its 10th anniversary. I've been around for about seven of those. And a new Science Circle podcast was one goal for the new decade. So we partnered up and it's a good match, I think, with what we each bring to the table. i just introduce myself a little before I introduce our other guests today. I've been a professor of communications for some 20 years, teaching courses at UCLA, UCSB, California Lutheran National. I'm one of those road-running adjuncts who got a late start in academia. Prior to becoming an instructor, I was a professional journalist, a working journalist for a lot of years of my life, mostly in broadcast as a news anchor and a TV bureau chief in Moscow and hosting a talk net radio show for a few years. Those skills come in handy here. And before that, I, I worked for economic development programs and social services, and I've been published in a number of journals with articles about fiscal and practical ed issues in international education and transcultural teaching and new technologies for bringing education access to precluded peoples. I've been doing that for a number of years, and I've been working at Educational Builds and Second Life since 2007, as most of us have here in the room. Uh, I am coming back back in with a new build after a couple of years off. There are lots of free learning resources and streaming media and games to play just over the hill, about 25 steps from here. It's not far. Uh, and there is a sign here, stage right. Click on that. It'll give you uh, some landmarks to a few places you might want to take a look at. So given all that, let's go ahead and uh, let's get to our podcast guests and let them talk for a bit. Our very first podcast guest was the very first Science Circle presenter exactly 10 years ago, Philip Youngblood. We talked about the past, present, and the future of Science Circle, and he beautifully expressed the immersive experience of Science Circle in this short clip. Well, I look at some of the topics that you've done over the years here, Phil. You've mentioned some of them yourself. Global climate change. So you did a presentation on DNA and telecommunications. I'm very curious how you combine those two topics. What are some of the challenges in covering some of these complex issues you're bringing in and still enlighten people on some of these important topics? 
That's a very fascinating uh, question because that gets to the heart of what we're able to do, is that since most of the presentations are somewhat uh, slide lecture type of things, but as I mentioned, you can bring in dynamic props. We can go on field trips to the Grand Canyon or ancient Abyssinia or to the bottom of the ocean. You talked about some of the visual qualities that you can bring into a presentation, but it's much more than visual, isn't it? It's actually immersive. You don't get just to look at a molecule, but you can actually mix with the molecule and, and uh, shrink down and become even smaller and see the atomic structures of the molecule, not just as an outside observer, but as, as an immersive participant. Isn't that true? Absolutely. You can think of it as like the Alice in Wonderland type thing. You can literally, there's islands that are sponsored by NASA and NOAA and uh, the Mars Institute and Exploratorium and there's places on the one with the Exploratorium where you can can ride a atom and see how Brownian motion works. Or you can see on the one by NOAA how a glacier retreats due to global warming or advances and such. And all this is in three dimensions, so you can fly and look at different objects and uh, where Darwin's beagle and where you can go ashore and become the explorer and, and find things and go on treks and treasure hunts. It's in a totally immersive world with noises and waterfalls and birds, which I wish everyone could be involved in that. And Phil goes on to say that's the prime motivator for the Science Circle podcast to bring some of our in-world experience to those who can only access it through these podcasts. And we're going to hear from uh, Phil again just a little bit later as we wrap up today. I had to practice a good number of words before interviewing Stephen Gazer. He is cutting edge in molecular genetics, and he put some of my Frankensteinian concerns in context with this short clip. Do you, uh, do you see anything really promising, really exciting uh, right now on the horizon that uh, you might be able to talk about? We can, we can put DNA of almost any configuration we want into almost any cell we want, in almost any organism that we want. Are we on the verge of some Frankensteinian world where we're going to be able to create basically whatever we want? No, I think we always have this larger template of what is the genome of an organism already. And so I don't think in the next 50 years we're going to do much more than really tinker on the edges with what we can do. But I think when you think about the applications of genetic engineering, a lot of times it's what need is driving it. And so when you think about at least in the area of agriculture, and the population density of the world and the amount of arable land we have, genetic engineering might ultimately be what's most important for humans to survive on the planet in terms of making enough crops with enough nutrition with a small amount of land and changing climate or a much hotter amount of climate that uh, affects us globally. You know, man, maybe could be a little bit worried about what sort of genetic alterations are happening, but the the need for it is to keep the human race alive. So I think in terms of, you know, it's maybe a little bit far out there in terms of the big scenarios, but that's one way of looking at it. And thank you, Stephen Gazer. Rob Dopp, another one of our early guests, he has a way of making complicated physics accessible. I see he's going to be presenting uh, in world again on the new pictures of the black hole. He is a Caltech trained astrophysicist with much to share. And we're talking about as many science circle presentations in this podcast interview. And he gives this quick fun take on the demographics of black holes. You know, this is the challenge of teaching and presenting these complicated ideas, isn't it? It's to simplify something complex without dumbing it down or missing the key takeaway points. And obviously you do that so well. I've been looking at some of the other presentation topics. Black hole demographics, what's, what's that about? Demographics, of course. Uh, what I was doing in that talk was talking about what sorts of black holes are out there and what do we know about them. And I started with the notion that there's actually two different things we call black holes that only recently have we become extremely confident that they're the same thing. One is the black holes that general relativity predicts, um, singularities, event horizons, all of that. And the other is dense, non-light-emitting objects that we see in astronomy. So we've always assumed that the latter is the former, but it could be there's other things that, I mean, that our current physics necessarily doesn't have. 
or doesn't necessarily have, I should say, that could be these dense, dark objects, and they're not actually black holes, but we call them black holes. So I like to distinguish between astrophysical black holes and general relativistic black holes. But, of course, recently with LIGO discovering gravitational waves and black holes, the notion that these black holes really are the general relativity things is getting to be a very strong notion. But demographics, we know lots of black holes that are what I call small, you know, only 10 times the mass of the sun. That's not very big, right? I mean, we carry that around in our pocket. And then there's these supermassive black holes, billion times the mass of the sun, our galaxy has one that's 4 million times the mass of the sun at its core, so that's small for a supermassive black hole. Only very recently have there been papers claiming to discover black holes around 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 solar mass. So that's the kind of thing I was talking about there. What's out there? How do we know? What is the evidence? What are the observations that we see, and how does this relate to general relativity? That's the general overview of that talk. You can see in this slide picture here, Rob is a violinist. And we have several other uh, performing musicians in the Science Circle group. I know that's true. Perhaps we could put on a show someday. I loved this uh, interview with Greg Perrier. Uh, he's a retired science educator, also living here in California. I'm here in the California South Coast. Uh, our backgrounds are so similar. It was a chance to introduce us both with nearly the same resume bullets. Both of us have connections to UCLA. Uh, we both work for Peace Corps and VISTA, which are program cousins. And we both spent several years with the U.S. Agency for International Development. And we both lived and worked in Northern Virginia and did those awful daily drives to Washington, D.C. And uh, we've both been working for about a decade building virtual world learning. And during our ranging interview perched above the Nova campus in Second Life, he shared his practical insights on why student experience in virtual worlds is essential. Greg, you've been working in virtual world platforms with education projects for a number of years. What do you see happening in the near future with this educational technology? Well, I think it's going to be necessary to have students get some background in virtual worlds because I think they're going to become part of the work environment in the future. And so I'm really excited about getting students in here. We bring about 400 students to the campus every year. And we have a very good feedback from them, you know, about... 25% love it, another 25% find it interesting, and I'm only really about 10% really hate it, you know, and you're going to get that with almost any college project. So I think it's a great way for students to learn, especially visual learners who like to interact with things. They really love coming into virtual worlds and doing things. And so we've found this to be a very great way to teach biology. When they have snow days, the campus closes, the labs are not functioning, the students can come in and do these labs in Second Life, and that's really made our use of this region in Second Life increase quite a bit. Lots of interactivity uh, in some of the exercises the students could do there visiting uh, the Nova site. What, what sorts of uh, engagement do you have? What, what brings them in and gives them something to do? Well, we've made um, activities that they have to go in and interact with objects and note cards and read things. And, and we have a handout that tells them how to do this. And these handouts are really a work of art. We've had to change them over the years, make them better. It's, we get a lot of student feedback on that. And it walks the students through the activity, and at the end there's a set of questions the students should be able to answer if they've done the activity. And so they come in, they do this interaction with objects, like the, they can make a glucose molecule, they can look at macromolecules like proteins and nucleic acids, they can go into a cell and fly around, they can go into a forest and measure ecology aspects of this forest. We have lots of different activities they can do. And so the students come in and do that, they answer the questions and send that to the professor. Professor. And the professor never comes into Second Life. They don't have to, but the students do. And I just love this thought that we've gone from uh, being sometimes ridiculed for our efforts in virtual worlds to now it's even becoming uh, an employable skill. And you are one of the heroes paving the way, Greg. Thank you for that. This is a fun one here. I may have failed chemistry in high school, but I never had a teacher like Michael Shaw. He's a chemist. He's a Science Circle board member. And he brings 3D crystals the size of elephants to the room. You better duck. Here's a clip from, uh, from Mike. 
And we're back speaking with Dr. Michael Shaw, who sometimes uses whimsy to make science friendly. Catalysis in Wonderland. What a great title. What other tricks and appeals might you use, Mike, to help you connect with a sometimes reluctant audience so science might be more approachable? One of the wonderful things about Second Life, for example, and the virtual worlds in which we present is that they are 3D worlds. And they are uh, multi-user. You can have a whole bunch of people in there at the same time. I always try to have crystal structures that I can just bring down. They float like, well, they look like elephants because I make them that size, but they float and rotate in front of the audience and we can delicately point out structural features that sometimes make some uh, complicated scientific point. But, you know, once you actually see the 3D aspects in 3D in, you know, as constructed by your own brain because of the goggles, you know, you almost have to duck when you see one of my molecules <laughs> flying at you. And what a wonderful way to learn uh, chemistry is that uh, not only are the chemical mixes potentially dangerous, but the 3D visualizations as well. <laughs> Be forget, sure to duck. <laughs> I forget who said it, but evidently the best demonstrations are ones in which there's a finite probability <laughs> instructor dying. <laughs> and thank you for making uh, learning so much fun, Mike. And this here, this is a must-listen-to episode. It's an interview with a patent attorney and biologist, Matthew Burr. He has lots of useful suggestions on how you as a creator might protect your writings and your inventions. It's not as hard as you might think. And Matt had some interesting thoughts on where the future of innovation might be leading in this clip. You've been working now as a patent attorney for more than 20 years, going on a quarter century, I believe. And uh, have you seen patterns in inventions and patents over this time that gives you some kind of sense of where we may be heading uh, as a people, as a species? Of course, the biggest pattern in patent law has been the explosion of electronic and digital technologies, of course. Um, and in fact, the explosion of software in the last 20 years has resulted in modifications of the patent law. It's changed the way the patent system, for example, views obviousness when you submit a patent. One of the bases that a patent can be rejected is that it's um, obvious. And the explosion of software patents and uh, digital uh, technologies has forced the law to modify what it considers obvious. So electronics and digital works is, is a clear a trend. Um, I think we may be on the cusp of seeing perhaps a similar explosion in biology with the advent of gene editing. Um, not quite sure how that's going to play out, but I will say that I do think uh, gene editing technologies hold either the promise or the threat of really transforming the human species. I think the technology, maybe not in a few generations, but maybe in three or four hundred years, who knows, will become so cheap and so widespread and so tantalizing. Um, it'll be so hard to not want to have a designer baby that's going to be smart and athletic and tall um, and so forth, or who knows, or have immunity diseases. I think that's going to be so tantalizing that eventually we are going to succumb to it. Hidden treasures indeed, uh, Chantel. As I talk to the guests coming in from the Science Circle, I am constantly amazed just what kinds of nuggets we have here in our treasure chest. And it's thrilling to be able to open the lid on that and share some of our riches with the world, our scientific and educational riches. Thank you for helping make this a possibility. Here is a wonderful podcast in this excerpt from Dr. Robert Hendricks. Uh, he had an illustrious career starting as a farm boy. I love his story. And he worked his way into medical school and eventually became a surgeon and medical educator. And uh, now retired, he's sharing his expertise in the science circle. He's presented on an outbreak of fatty liver disease and ways for us to make ourselves healthier around the world. And in our interview with this excerpt, he has some important tips on proper diet and exercise. And then he unexpectedly started speaking about magic in this clip. Back to the theme of mind and body connection, are there physical exercises we might undertake for reducing mental anguish and anxiety? And are there also mental exercises that might increase our physical well-being? I think in terms of physical fitness, 
the easiest and most inexpensive thing, at least get out and take walk, especially outside where you can see the plants. There's something that happens in the brain when you see green and blue. People have this twofold magic. Everybody has two kinds of magic that I can identify. And one is that you have the ability to change your surroundings within your boundaries, to change what's right in front of you. And you can jolt yourself from one state, including from deep lulls and sadness, and do feeling a lot better by just changing what you're doing, just even getting out and taking a walk. Or the other magic is the magic of words. You can take something that's arcane or hard to understand, and uh, you find words for it, and you start to get your mind around it, and you start to pick it apart and come to understand it, and then you got it contained. There's no ubiquitous, unending happiness to be found. It comes like some sunny days and uh, some are rainy, as an old metaphor. But if from moment to moment you can feel satisfied and accepting of yourself, it doesn't matter if you're... Uh, a dishwasher or the CEO of a company, if you're doing things you enjoy and you're doing the best job you can and you're dealing with your life in a positive way, you can be proud of it and you should be respected for it. Uh, thank you, doctor. Hope to have you back soon. You also had some good advice for young people uh, overwhelmed with stress and depression. He had some good tips on uh, how you might deal with that 15 minute clip. It's worth 15 minutes out of your day. Some advice from the good doctor. And here we go. This was a recent uh, presentation by Bud Turner for Science Circle. He was targeting the issue of our digital legacy, the rights to what you create and might pass on uh, in your social media, our virtual world builds. And it got me thinking not only about the loss to our heirs, who might not be able to access and continue our works, but also the loss to society at large. What do you think is lost when these digital creations simply disappear? What's the value there? Is it the knowledge lost, the artistry lost? Is, is there a cost to society? Matt? Well, yeah, isn't that interesting to think about? I, um, I do think that there is a, a bit of a loss. Some of these platforms are so mature now that they have historical landmarks and they have their own institutions and they have kind of their own history. And I think just like we like to preserve historical landmarks in the real world, for the very same reasons, there's value to preserving them in the virtual world. Do you see any major gaps that the law should be addressing? This is all new technology as a society. We're still trying to figure out this social media, let alone some of the legal aspects of passing on the rights. What, what are, do you think are some of the more critical issues that the law, maybe uh, legislators, need to address? Bud? Well, just that. I think people need to get in touch with their state and federal legislators and make them aware that digital creations should be protected just like real world ones because up until now really all of the providers have a very narrow point of view about intellectual property and if it's been created on their servers then it belongs to them regardless of who created it or how so you know we lose educational art and even philosophical stuff all of which makes a difference to our culture Thank you for that, uh, Bud and Matt, and your work uh, protecting and promoting our digital rights. It's a very important cause, one that isn't going to be going away in the near future, and certainly one we all have a vested interest in. Not too long ago, I gave a Science Circle presentation right here uh, on this stage uh, on the topic of transgalactic relations or what we might expect from our first encounter with an alien species. And it touched on theories of exobiology, convergent evolution, the social systems we might share in common, such as specialization of labor, distribution of resources, education, defensive powers, philosophical and artistic expression. Uh, it's been posted on the podcast platform. And in this clip, I suggest the most important question is not what they might be like, but how we might respond to them. One of my students said when she travels internationally, she leaves her know-it-all face at home and instead wears a face of humility and questioning. And she finds herself even more welcomed because of it.
And this image is known as the Blue Marble. It was taken by the Apollo 17 mission in the 70s. NASA says that even today it is the single most requested image in their archives. And seen from space, our planet looks so inviting and vibrant, unified, even peaceful. It's the face we turn to the universe. So let's wear a face of humility and curiosity, and we may find a new and wider welcome to the cosmos. This is once again an excerpt from board member and founding presenter for the Science Circle, Phil Youngblood. And here he is talking about the future and the mission of the Science Circle. How about taking a moment and just looking 10 years ahead, the future of educational technology, the future of Science Circle. You've made it through 10 years, quite likely you'll make it through another 10 years. Do you think we're going to be on a good course looking at the decade ahead? Are they going to be in sync what Science Circle is trying to do, what uh, educational technology is allowing for? What's your vision of what's to come? I'm an eternal optimist, and I think that uh, coming back to one of the things you said is that science transcends boundaries. It transcends ages. It transcends nationalities and such. It always has, even before virtual world and before the Internet. The idea of discovery and exploration and sharing ideas with each other has always been there, regardless of the politics, regardless of the finances, regardless of the times and such. So I see this becoming a stronger thing. And if we can help in some way to uh, foster it, then that's what we want to do. In 10 years from now, I actually see kind of a indistinguishable thing between the physical and the imaginary. In other words, when you're in a classroom, everybody has glasses. The glasses help them to, is an augmented reality, help them to see what it is that's being talked about. So it's not just so people can learn in different modes. It's not just the person giving up and doing a lecture. It's not just the voice like we have here, but it's the visual where they can reach out and touch and manipulate and change and ask questions and talk to each other. I see nothing but positive ahead. We also have to watch a little bit about the divisions between rich and poor and so that's one of the reasons, of course, we're, we're trying to reach out to everyone and trying to have open education and free education on science so that everyone can partake of what we've learned and we can learn from them and their perspective as well. And he was a wonderful guest for the inaugural episode of The Science Circle. If you're out there, Phil, thank you so much. Our podcast interview ran about 45 minutes long, and you had so many good things to say. It was hard to pick out just one or two to share as an excerpt. Give it a listen, people, if you want an informative look at what a Science Circle was and is and could well be. And uh, there are direct links to the full podcast episode. I'm going to be sharing uh, some of those in just a moment. Also download the PDF file of these slides. You can click on those as well. Or you can go to www.mr.us and find a copy of it there. Uh, wrapping up today, here's who I would like to bring on in the near future. High above it all is a diversity of guests and topics, nationalities, perspective, fields of expertise, and certainly more women in science. Let's try to bring some of those in. Uh, you see Mayam Bialik. Well, she's a Ph.D. graduate from UCLA, where I also teach. She's a star on the Big Bang Theory. Perhaps you've seen her there. Her manager and her publicist, I've contacted those, and they like the idea of her on our podcast. Once she's wrapped up the final season of the Big Bang Theory and all her interviews are done for that, William Shatner, I know that name popped out at you. Uh, one of my former writers uh, for an educational webzine uh, some 15 years ago. Well, he's now the publicist for William Shatner, and we've stayed in touch over the years. I believe he took this picture of Bill. You can see it there on his 88th birthday. He gets to call him Bill. I'll call him Mr. Shatner. And he is pitching a podcast interview for the Science Circle to Bill. Uh, since we have so many Star Trek fans here, and of course, course, the more platforms we get, the more subscribers, the more viewers, the more enticing it's going to be to bring in some of these people. And there's also Harvard-trained brain surgeon Alan Hamilton. I've read his book. He's got a new one coming out on the fascinating functions 
of brain and mind and how the two intertwine. He's held it in his fingers, and that should make an interesting interview. And again, as we add more subscribers and platforms, the more appeal we're going to have to potential guests. And I hope many other Science Circle members and presenters also feel more confident and comfortable appearing on the podcast as we get to know one another better. And we've got a stable here of expertise and speakers. Perhaps you live in one of the Science Circle member countries, the 20 or so different countries we have here. And you have someone in your homeland with insights to share in science and education and the arts. And you can help us expand the international diversity of our guests. Please send me an email right there. It's on the screen. Suggestions to send uh, Stephen at www.mr.us. And if it's yourself, that's fine. Or if there's somebody you know that you can put me in touch with and make an introduction, that helps a lot. If it's uh, somebody that uh, you've already connected with, lots. Lots of time goes into producing these episodes. It may be just a 15-minute uh, podcast, but it takes hours. To put one of those together, the biggest crunch is trying to coordinate guests. So if you can put me in direct contact with somebody you think would make a good guest, I appreciate that very much. You've done this before. You've worked on these. I know we've got some organizers and coordinators out there. You know what we need to do. Uh, let's just quickly go through the list. Uh, durability uh, is critical. Uh, the Science Circle podcast, we've only been online for some four months now, and that's not much historic credibility yet. Uh, people want to see you around for about a year before they start giving you that kind of credence, and that's readily won. Uh, we need a demonstrated durable year, a consistent flow of quality podcasts and increasing numbers of platforms and subscribers. And that's how we will rise considerably in the search engines and the playlists. And that's where you got to be getting the returns. And that just takes some time. Uh, subscribers are important. If you are on one or more of our hosting platforms, please do subscribe to the podcast. And if you have a podcast platform suggestion anywhere in the world, please do send it. The more platforms we get, the wider reach we achieve. Enhancing our diversity and global outreach, well, that's also important, especially in developing nations. That's what we're trying to do with these, isn't it? Get our word out to uh, parts of the world that may not reach us otherwise through these podcasts. So please do suggest any connections you might have, academic or platforms. We do have some great educational resources to share both the Science Circle Foundation and my own Educare Research Program, we are nonprofit NGOs eligible for grant support to help expand support for free education access and also some technological enhancements on our own platforms that helps build and improve uh, production quality. Here again are the current platforms that carry the Science Circle podcast. Please subscribe uh, to it on one or as many uh, of these platforms as you may use. You can download again the slideshow PDF and use the live links to connect directly to the podcast. You won't have to do any searching. We'll land you right on the page. Or go to www.mr.us. And you can find a copy of the slides I've used in this presentation along with the links that you can click. You don't have to look hard for it. If you go to the website, www.mr.us, it's right there at the top. Just click the podcast link. And here are my own links, ways you can contact me. And there's my email address. Feel free. Drop me a note with any suggestions you might have. Any of the resources posted on any of these websites, it's all free and open for educational use. Do what you can with it. Spread the word. Uh, lots of free resources for international teachers and students to bring into their classrooms, as well as the podcast interviews. Those are very good, brief 15-minute lectures. The students like it brief, succinct, and interesting. That's certainly what we got here. Tap into any of these resources, use these resources, share these resources. Hope to see you again in the near future. Thank you so much. Have a good day.
The Science Circle is a nonprofit program based in the Netherlands with a recording studio here in Southern California. For more information on this podcast and other Science Circle programs, please visit sciencecircle.org. That's sciencecircle.org. This podcast is under Creative Commons license and is freely available for educational use. Until the next time, I'm your host, Stephen Van Hook. Be well. Thank you.